good to talk about a city. Oh, I love the 60s. Well, what was so wonderful about the 60s? The 60s, we had some of the most prominent, wonderful people in the world killed. We had Vietnam. What was so wonderful? You got to smoke grass? What was so wonderful about the 60s? 60s were good for America. Not off some of the pressure cooker that existed. Uh, that conformity was dangerous. Uh, that Cold War conformity. The 60s really started to question these things. The 60s said you can be anything you want to be. You can go out and have free sex, you can go out and have free drugs, you can go out and not have to fight battles and stay free people. You can have free, free, free. I certainly think there were excesses in the 60s. Now, if America thought we could get out of racism in a nice, measured way, could overturn segregation and without some excesses, then I think it underestimated the force and effect of segregation. People had been lied to about everything. All right, we've been lied to about everything. We're going to have to test everything. And I, we did some pretty stupid things. I took a hit of Osley White Lightning Acid, and I became an instant hippie. Instantly, because of that acid. These kids got nothing to do but run around the streets and then go home and have a lot of free love and smoke dope. Here I am, you know, scratching my head, wondering how I'm going to both pay both the light bill and the gas bill this month. You know, because I've got four kids. To, all you can do is walk around the street in sandals. They would always say, go slow and do it decorously. There was always this sense of great politeness and decorousness. And you must understand that we felt dropping carpet bombings on people was not very decorous. I was at Wisconsin when some students bombed one of the buildings. And I said, let's go down to the student union, and I will bet you $50 that within five minutes, we will be able to find someone who will argue that that kid deserved to die because he was in that building. And I won that $50. We meant to be intolerable. America and the American people were intolerable to us. And we were in opposition to them. And we meant to ignore them, and we meant to get them angry, and we meant to confront them. We should have done more. We should have valued the time. There were a lot of mistakes made that you know, if we'd known what we were doing, we wouldn't have made them. The 60s will never level out. Maybe it's just that in every 60s decade, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, we have to go through some crisis like this. But there was certainly, uh, certainly that, that we had us a time and we're still trying to figure out what it was all about. The 1960s was the most tumultuous, confusing, and controversial decade of the 20th century. It still inspires passionate debate. But there's no debate about this. The 1960s was an era of rebellion. Most of those who rebelled were young. And although they were a minority of their generation, their numbers were sufficient. Their beliefs so strong. And their behavior so challenging that many mainstream Americans saw them as a significant threat to the nation's morals, manners, and values. The result was a period of almost continuous conflict. Making sense of all this is very much a matter of understanding who rebelled, what triggered their rebellions, how the rest of the country reacted to them, and what happened to America as a result. These young people didn't suddenly begin to rebel at the stroke of midnight on January 1st, 1960. The seeds of the 60s were planted earlier. First of these seeds was an enormous increase in the American birth rate that began in 1946, known as the baby boom. By the 60s, their sheer numbers, 76 million in all, would give this generation unprecedented power and influence. Those of us who brought the baby boom into being 
the returning World War II veterans, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. I mean, we really didn't know. We all came home and we all had children. There was no advice, really. Dr. Spock had a book out, but we didn't know anything about child rearing. In other words, let me try to say it this way. There were certain things that you just did. Today is a high point in the romance of Bob and Mary. For them, the future looks bright. We didn't know anything about relationships, communication between husband and wife. There was very little communication. Children, child rearing, uh, how do you raise children? No one knew. In other words, it was supposed just to happen. George Leonard and other members of his generation may not have known how to raise their children, but they did know that they wanted to protect them from the tough times they had experienced. The parents of the 1950s were, I think, the most unusual generation of the 20th century. These are the people who had grown up in the Depression. They had experienced real tough times when they were children and when they were teenagers. And then World War II hit, as many of them were just reaching adulthood, and they had the trauma of the war. And then, after all that, they reached the 1950s at a time when the U.S. was tremendously prosperous, when the economy was booming as we've never seen it before. And I think they reacted to that prosperity, and they think, I think they reacted strongly to all of the trauma of the Depression and the war by turning inward a bit, by marrying young, by emphasizing home and family, as if that was something they couldn't get back in the 30s and 40s and now valued all the more. And this is Levittown. Here you can own your own home, complete with its own refrigerator, television set, and clothes dryer. You can raise your children far from the city's dirt, crowding and crime, in comfort and safety. Growing up in the suburbs, nearly 70% of white middle-class baby boomers spent their childhoods in these totally new communities. For these young people and their older brothers and sisters, this environment would have an enormous impact on how they would behave in the 60s. It was a perfect um, setting in which the youth culture, in a certain sense, could, could blossom. Uh, life in the suburbs was organi organized around the kids again. Uh, they were the center of attention, a ra endless round of Little League games and PTA meetings, etc. So it was in the suburbs, in a, a certain sense, that this message about the importance and the uniqueness and the generational potency associated with these kids, I think, was delivered with real force. In the average American family today, children are the object of more concentrated thought and concern than the young of any previous generation. For out of an increasing understanding of child psychology has come an awareness that children are real people with individual personalities which must be respected and encouraged. This was a distinctly new way to be raised in the world. And it allowed, um, for a whole generation that I suppose we would now call spoiled, spoiled kids, which from another point of view simply meant kids who had very high expectations in life with respect to freedom and happiness. They thought life was about being free and about being happy. And they carried those expectations forward into high school and into college uh, and brought with them a kind of um, um, uh, a level of expectation that was simply unprecedented in, I, I would say, in world history. We found out in the 50s that if you got up in the morning and went to work and did a good day's work, uh, that things got better. You got promoted or you got more money, uh, you were able to buy furniture, you could have more children, the children could have better clothes, and life just improved. We knew it was because you went to work. But I'm not sure our children realized that. They saw simply that the clothes got better, the house got bigger, the, the neighborhood got nicer. And I have a strong suspicion that what happened in the late 60s was that the kids who rebelled took it for granted that life would improve automatically. Now here's a major seed of the 60s. Because of their profoundly different life experiences, kids had trouble understanding why their fathers worked so hard. The way many of them saw it, their fathers were engaging in the single-minded pursuit of material comforts. My dad was always above board in all his business dealings, but I would say money and getting ahead and, 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 and making a lot of bucks was his goal. 
And I think what it was was dad meant well. Dad wanted to love us, but dad was so busy at work. He would work till two, three in the morning doing artwork, artwork for the business. He'd get up early and be gone. I hardly ever saw him. Everything young boys saw at home and on TV told them that if they did as they were supposed to, they would be, quote, lucky enough to follow in their father's footsteps. The Cub Scout program helps the boys' adjustment both to the family and to the group. This son of yours has been fighting again. Look at this shirt. Can I tell you about it, Pop? Look, he's proud of it. Please, Pop. Not now, Jerry. I'm tired. I had a Mike bad Kelly day. Mike Kelly said you didn't have the guts to stand up for yourself, so I took a poke at him. That was all right, Poor wasn't it? Mike. What TV showed you was a world in which men were essentially impotent. He didn't have any right to say that about you, did he, Pop? Go to your room and get a decent shirt. This minute. Did he, Pop? There were no chance for risk. There was no place for excitement. There was no place for no challenges being offered whatsoever. And the other kind of show you could watch were the Westerns, which showed uh, what a real man could do, measuring himself against other men, uh, especially with a gun. And I think that anybody who was a, a red-blooded American boy in the, uh, in the 1950s knew that they wanted to be more like Matt Dillon or more like uh, the paid gunfighter and have gun will travel than they wanted to be uh, Beaver Cleaver's father. Isn't it wonderful how this washer does all these heavy things? And what did girls feel was in store for them? A life just like their mother's. Judy. It isn't as bad as all that, dear. Sorry, Mother. I, I was just thinking. About what? Oh, you know. Thinking of how awful wash day used to be for you before you had the electric water heater and the washer. So now I add the pectin. Educational films like this one reflect society's belief that women could find fulfillment only as housewives and mothers. Now I let it come to a full rolling boil again. It won't take long. You like to cook, don't you, Pat? Oh, it's not just liking to cook. It's, it's more. It's, well, it's accomplishing something. It's me cooking. Me, Susan Douglas. And not just cooking, but, well, creating something special. Oh, I wish Miss Holland could talk to you. She could say it so much better than I can. Who's Miss Holland? She's my home economics teacher. Not enough of anyone means soup instead of jelly. Even girls who were sent to college often majored in what were called the domestic sciences. Oh, my well, there's one nice thing about it happening in class. Here is part of our learning. At home, it would be a minor tragedy. There was a song when I went to college at Smith College, which they don't sing anymore, I know, that had a verse that went something like this. You're sharp as a pinpoint. Your grades are really ten point. You are Dean's list, Sophia Smith. But when a man wants a kiss kid, he doesn't want a quiz kid. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains, with your brains, with your brains. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains. And it had verses that went on and on. Now, I sang that in 1957 with a sense of how true it was and how funny it was. Now, of course, it makes a shiver run up and down my spine. I had four choices of things that I could be when I grew up. I could be a teacher, a nurse, a stewardess, or a secretary. Um, I couldn't go into to things that, that dealt with medicine. I couldn't go into law. I couldn't go into the real professions. Um, it was, it was extremely limiting, and of course the overall goal was to find a husband, um, get married, have children, and live with a white picket fence. I used to make little stews for my child, and used to spit them out and stick them on the wall, but I went on doing it. I don't know why. Uh, Dr. Spock, I, I think Dr. Spock ruined everything. I really do. I mean, he's, he's wonderful in the peace movement. But the, 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 this whole image of, of giving your children everything you had and they, they have to be satisfied and they have to be content, and I think we gave them much too much. In 1957, 
Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, starring the entire Nelson family. Here's Ozzie. Here's Harriet. And here it is, the American family of the 1950s, as it was seen thousands of evenings on TV. Happy kids, happy father, happy mother. Everyone behaving as they were supposed to. You know, it's none of my business, but don't you think taking riding lessons is a pretty expensive way to meet a girl? The message was absolutely unmistakable. This was the way your life should be. And if it wasn't, something must be very wrong. Everyone watched Ozzy and Harriet and assumed that everyone they knew lived that life. And then they went around pretending that they lived it too. But no one really did. Even Ozzy and Harriet didn't. <laughs> so on some level, there's been a myth all along. And part of the plague of the 50s was the incredible personal efforts, the incredible pain involved in perpetuating that myth about one's own family, about one's own happiness in that family, about the health of that family. They saw women as feeling very discontented. They saw husbands feel pressured, harried by the demands of their jobs and families. And they saw children as feeling extremely alienated. Uh, so clearly, I think many of the roots of the 60s explosions were planted in the supposedly placid family of the 1950s. This boy and girl coming home from school look quite content with life. They're looking forward to an important date, dinner at home with the family. Though they seem artificial today, educational films like this one, which were shown to school children all over America, accurately reflect the attitudes and values of white middle-class society in the 1950s, when real-life documentaries were few and far between. Doesn't that sound exciting to you? Their purpose was to teach kids the proper way to behave and to repeat and reinforce a set of rules. The rules were, uh, were, uh, were things you talked about on the telephone with your friends. And, uh, and they were, they were uh, uh, imposed by your parents. Parents talked about it a lot. There were high school counselors who told you what the rules were. And even if they weren't written down, everybody really knew and you could almost read them out, cite them. And I think looking back on it from the 60s, uh, what, we, what, what people did in the 60s was self-consciously break every damn one of them. The women of this family seem to feel that they owe it to the men of the family to look relaxed, rested and attractive at dinner time. Brother notices the time and realizes that he must put things in order and clean himself up in time for dinner. What were the rules? One of them was obey authority. Don't ask questions. In the 60s, millions of young people would renounce that one. These boys greet their dad as though they are genuinely glad to see him, as though they had really missed being away from him during the day and are anxious to talk to him. This is the time for pleasant discussion in a thoroughly relaxed mood. They don't pick this time of the day to spring unpleasant surprises on Dad. We are molding our boys the way we feel they should be molded in the 50s. I think you have to start molding right away when they're just infants. And so uh, that was our influence. We tried to make this a very influential time, a constructive time, through Boy Scouts, through church, through Cub Scouts, through Little League, or not Little League, but uh, the Little Pony Leagues or whatever they had, you know, these little kids. It was awfully cute. Yeah, they were fun times with our kids, with our boys. We had a great time. Let father and mother guide the conversational trend if they desire. After all, they made all this possible. My impression of that time was that a child was to be seen and not heard, and that we were never allowed to express uh, anything that was negative. We were never allowed to talk back in any way, uh, even to question why should I do something or could I do it later. Uh, we weren't treated as, we, as if we were uh, people, we were another species. Another rule, control your emotions. In the 60s, masses of baby boomers would reverse this one and quote, let it all hang out. Oh, I'm so happy. I could 
be a model. Or a cover girl. Hey, what's gotten into that crazy kid sister? Oh, Jeff, don't be that way. Notice how Mother seems to become angry herself because of Jeff's anger. Perhaps she shouldn't, but anger is a violent emotion, and we often see an induction of behavior or spread of emotion to other persons, almost like a contagious disease. If you misbehaved, you weren't normal. Uh, and, and the idea of normal is a, it, uh, is a kind of vegetative state where nothing happens. Uh, but that's uh, what everybody tried to aspire to. Uh, uh, but I think, I think it's a word that people are constantly using to, uh, to exhort you to behave better. Why don't you be normal? It's not normal to, uh, it's not normal to wear your hair long. It's not normal to, uh, to wear Levi's. It's not normal to listen to rock and roll. It's, it's not normal to, uh, to read comic books. It's, uh, there's a whole list of, of a million things that everybody does that isn't normal. Well, what makes you think they look at your clothes? Oh, because the other fellas wear sweaters or just shirts, not a regular suit like mine. Well, wear a sweater then. Another rule, fit in with the group. Don't stand out. Conform in your actions and your appearance. In the 60s, great numbers of young people would, quote, do their own thing. Pick out the most popular boys and girls in school and keep an eye on them. Try to figure out why people like them. Not that you'll ever be just like any of them, but you might learn something. Well, see you there. Many young people found these restrictions painfully repressive, but they struggled to obey them anyhow, because if they didn't, they knew there'd be unpleasant consequences from society or from their peers. Yoo-hoo! Jenny thinks that she has the key to popularity, parking in cars with the boys at night. When Jerry brags about taking Ginny out, he learns that she dates all the boys. What about Ginny? Does that make her really popular? Do the boys and girls like her? Is she welcome to join this group? Hi, Betty, Ellie. You can rest your tray here, Ginny, for a minute. Thanks. Say, Wally, how's the play coming along? Oh, okay, Ginny. Here, Jenny. No, Thanks, girls Jerry. who park in cars are not really popular. Not even with the boys they park with. Not when they meet at school or elsewhere. Nothing like being Miss Popularity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there was this sense that, yeah, well, sure, they're using sex to be popular now, but, you know, what about in the future? They're going to be, like, thrown on the rubbish pile. And I, and, I, and I think that that did happen, because I think that, that boys did maintain an attitude of, you know, they wanted to get laid, but they wanted to marry a virgin. Jeff, isn't that Eileen? It sure is. Baby and all. Gee, I haven't seen her since she left school. And maybe this was the biggest rule of all. Don't even think about having sex. In the 60s, young people all over the country would proclaim, if it feels good, do it. Mary, 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 wait, please. Sorry, Mary. In the height of emotion, it's not always easy to stop and think things through. But if you, if you just slow down the rush and pressure of your feelings a little, then judgment has a better chance to take hold and guide you away from wrong behavior. It was sort of a nightmare. Uh, looking from the outside, I'm sure it didn't seem that way to observe her, but for me, I felt so lonely. I, I, oh, they was popular and I didn't have those problems. I wasn't a nerd or anything like that, but there just wasn't anybody from my planet is the way that I kind of described it. I felt like I had so much bottled up inside of me. Most kids trying to behave properly did keep it all bottled up inside. But a minuscule number began to rebel. It was a preview of coming attractions. What startles me when I look back at my yearbook photos now, they all look so old. Everybody looks so old. I mean, they look like little adults, 
you know they don't it's it's startling to me how how old how already getting into the groove all of these people look with their flat top crew cuts and and then ever so often you know you turn the page and you see the guy with the duck tail and you know ah here's the rebel <laughs> Being a rebel by slicking your hair back and wearing a black leather jacket seems harmless now. But in the 1950s, many adults saw this as the first sign of teenagers going bad. Many teenagers are as concerned as their parents with the public's conception of today's youth. These students are portraying what we consider bad taste in school attire and behavior. This student is wearing an extremely tight skirt. Improper dress was an innocent way to defy adult restrictions. But a growing number of young people were turning against society's rules in more significant ways. No split levels, no Cadillac, no commuter's bridge, no falling weight. Like, I mean, what are they doing with their lives? Some were inspired by the beatniks, a small but conspicuous group of young adults in the big cities who dabbled in marijuana, wrote poetry, and won scores of imitators in high schools all over the country. Cellophane wrapped in the black nightmare of the endless factory. My soul squeezed in the hydraulic press of eternal drip, drip, drip. We started, uh, a bunch of us, putting out a poetry magazine, and suddenly it was banned because uh, of one little poem. And so we had our first publication suppressed, and I, the poem I still remember to this day was, I'd like to kiss just left of center of the valley of her breasts, and then I'd try the other side or something. <laughs> Anyhow, so they banned the magazine and we went outrageous. The banning of, quote, unacceptable ideas provoked certain politically aware students to begin questioning the values, the motives, and the judgment of school officials and others in authority. And then one day, the principal came into the class and had us all pass up our copies of Catcher in the Rye and told us to forget that we'd ever seen this book. We learned fairly quickly that the book had been banned by the school board. This turned out to be a real learning experience <laughs> for all of us, because uh, far we learned a lot more than we would have learned if we'd just been allowed to read the book. Because this way, of course, not only did we read the book, but everybody in the school suddenly wanted to read the book. Books could be censored, but now something came along that was much harder to stop something that millions of young people would seize and use as a means to further separate themselves from adult society. The arrival of rock and roll in my life was like something that came from another planet. We hadn't heard anything like that sound before. We hadn't heard people making that kind of noise, um, breaking all limits of politeness. And what was so strange is how so many people responded to someone very weird, like Little Richard, instantly, with no sense of distance, no sense of, of questioning, just, of course, yes, I've been waiting all my life for this, and I never knew it. My father had a sort of breakthrough once, as I recall, where he realized that they had their fads, too. When he was a young man, maybe older than 13, but when, oh, everything's upside down. When the music goes round and round, ooh, and it comes out here. Well, I heard this, and he said, this was a wild song that we had when I was a kid, and I said, yeah, that, that's wild. <laughs> you know. That was the first integrated setting I was ever in. But many, many parents and many children were scared of the words, the style, and the racial implications of black music. And then this godsend arrives on the horizon if you were white, Elvis Presley. It was an extraordinary godsend because soul music had really raised tremendous concerns among our parents. 
Elvis Presley comes and gives us rock and roll that's white. The irony is that the adults who thought of rock and roll as an act of rebellion, while the kids said it's not, it's just music, uh, those adults were right. That's the way kids are dancing nowadays. They call it rock and rolling or pop or something like that. It was a rebellion uh, against suburbia. It was a rebellion for me against, uh, against all of the conventions that seem to make life so stifling. And uh, rock and roll, along with, along with the beatnik movement, along with Kerouac and Ginsburg and things like that, it, it really uh, it, it helped to punch a hole in, 60, in the 50s conformity. feel, based upon the experiences throughout the country, that this rock and roll rhythm has been the seed of trouble, and we want to keep trouble out of Jersey City, Don. Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. That's the best way I know to get rid of them. The older generation was accusing rock and roll of encouraging everything from poor study habits to juvenile delinquency from drug taking to sexual immorality. Balls of fire. Kiss the baby. Point 25 of the communist goal, corrupt American young people, how? Through movies and music. That two-beat pattern is the music brought to the United States of America by the communist conspiracy to corrupt teenagers, and it's in every rock and roll number. Communism, I mean, I mean, the idea that rock and roll has anything to do with communism, rock and roll is sort of the ultimate flower of, of capitalism in a lot of ways. Um, it's inconceivable that a music that's based so deeply in, in hustling, in let's get rich, in one-hit wonders, um, you know, could have anything to do with a planned economy. I mean, the concepts are, you know, monumentally different. There was clearly no connection between rock and roll and communism. But communism was an important seed of the 60s because of the fear it generated. Americans feared communism because the Soviet Union had swallowed up country after country after World War II. And it seemed determined to swallow up America as well. About the age of 13, I and my friends became convinced that the Russians were actually going to take over the United States this year. And we formed a guerrilla army out in the, that would uh, wage uh, partisan warfare out in the woods. And we had, we dug uh, caves into hillsides and stockpiled uh, our pathetic, you know, ammunition and things. But we were ready. Let the Ruskies come. We were ready. Each day in school, kids were told that war could break out at any moment, an atomic war in which millions would die. Everybody's worried. In the 60s, the fear of instant annihilation convinced many young people that they should live for today, not the future. While the suit is made of this material, inside this layer is a shredded lead, a resistance against atomic rays. Okay, Richard, on your way to there, right, Each of us would dispense a dog tag, which we were told by this old teacher somewhat tactlessly, could withstand the heat of a thousand degrees centigrade, made not to melt. Unfortunately, our skin disintegrated about 900 degrees before, but we, we had the comfort of knowing we could be identified in the event we were burned beyond recognition in a nuclear holocaust. She actually put it that way. Attention, attention. This is an official civil defense warning. This is not a test. The United States is under nuclear attack.
It's going to happen. Duck and cover. And everybody puts their heads like this, and you scramble under the desk. And then we get up after it, and we resume our social studies. And nobody talks about it. Nobody talks. The teachers don't say, hey, this is crazy what we're doing to the kids. You know, this is not how we want. This is not how we want you to grow up to be, you know. No, the teachers just went through this stuff in some kind of numb trance because if they said no, why, God, who could say no but a lousy commie pinko sap because immediately the reactionaries were on the school board. Get that person out of here. We can't have pinkos teaching our kids. Go on. Americans reacted to communism by developing an almost religious conviction that communism and everything connected to it was evil and immoral. And everything about America was perfect, that America was the shining beacon of liberty and freedom. There's something about America that makes me shout with joy. It's a land of opportunity for every girl and boy. There's something about our president that makes me shout hooray. In America, we all might be the president someday. We, as a group, were taught that the world was uh, consisted of right and wrong, good and evil, the free world and the Iron Curtain. We were the free world. We were the leaders of the free world. Uh, if the United States did things, then we were right. This teaching, which combined indisputable truth with obvious exaggeration, was repeated over and over again in thousands of schools, from thousands of pulpits, and by many national leaders. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. There was these evil people, and I remember seeing movies, a movie where they, they, you went home one day and your home wasn't yours anymore. It was most distressing. I, th I think it was like really evil what, what uh, people told young children about communism. We learned in school that home life does not encourage the growth of the collective character which the party wishes to develop in its young people. It's your fault. You should have spent more time training us to think along party lines. As a member of the Young Pioneers, it will be my duty to report you. You better listen to me, all of you. I don't want to hear any more talk about state schools and party lines and collective character and deviationism. There's going to be a family again, and I know just where to start. You two are going to Sunday school, and you're going right now. Mommy, tell her! It's no use to argue. During this period, the belief that America was good and communism was evil became one of the nation's chief articles of faith and one of the most important seeds of the 60s because millions of America's children accepted it and based their faith in their country on its truth. I believed that this was reality. This was the United States of America, that anybody, no matter what color your skin, no matter what religion you were, what country your ancestors came from, none of that was supposed to matter. And that's what, was, that's what we were told. And I believed strongly. There's something about America that's wonderful to me. And do you know what that something is? We are really free. We are really free. That's what the 60s generation had been taught from birth. But they were seeing contradictory images on television, disturbing images from places like Little Rock, Arkansas. What led to the violence was black parents wanting to give their children the same good education white children were getting. This was an important part of a larger black civil rights struggle against prejudice and discrimination. For Southern black people, and for the millions of young whites who had been taught to believe in American justice and freedom, this struggle and what it said about America may be the most significant seed of the 60s.
In the South, black people were kept down not just by unwritten rules, but by laws backed by the full force of state and local government, the Jim Crow laws. While white parents were telling their kids to obey the rules so that prosperity and happiness would be theirs, black people had a very different vision of the American dream. The American dream for my particular family was survival. They did not want to do something that was going to rock the boat and interfere with the status quo. Um, I think that for them to have a job and to do anything or to have your kids do anything that would threaten the family livelihood was ridiculous. And so we stayed in our proper place. If you just don't understand the connection that we have with the colored people. In other words, we, we work with them and they work with us. And we're not going to take him and push him off somewhere just because we could do it. The idea was that you must go to the white man, it was the statement, to get everything you need. He controls everything, and if you fight him, he's going to fight back, and he's going to hurt you, and he's going to win. Had we been your friends for years? Yes, and, sir. Sure. Had we worked more of them than anybody in this country? Yes, sir. Sure, sure have. Right. Yes, in a strange, almost perverse way, it was the institution of segregation that gave black people the strength and the solidarity they needed to fight for equality. Segregation meant not only the hardships, and it meant not only the terrible anxiety, but it was also a sharing time. It was also a sense of community and a sense of collective accomplishment in the face of just terrible odds. People who experience a kind of holistic oppression find ways to develop an enclave find ways to develop values that nurture young children so that they are not given the message and internalize the message that we are nobody. They're given a message that your life has value, that what you're about uh, is respected by, by us, even if it's not by the outside world. And they're also given one other value, a sense of dignity and a sense of mission. The mission that was being given to young black people as they were growing up was crystal clear. Get a good education and use it to better yourself and society. Education was an absolute must because you learned early that the one thing no one could take from you was, was what was in your head. So you tried to acquire as much knowledge and education was just so important. I'm going to tell you the reason the white folks don't tell us to go to school and see to us going to school. If you learn yourself some sense, you're going to be just a little notch ahead of them. If you have to lick that for your children, wash your clothes at night, if they want them education, get it. Anybody can be nobody, but everybody can be somebody. In these southern community schools, students were being taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, and values that in a few years would give a generation of young black people the skills and the commitment to sustain the greatest social movement of 20th century America. I can remember in high school, teachers saying to you that you're going to learn everything I know about this before you leave my class. You know, and because these teachers were also from the community, they could whoop you. <laughs> they could. They could do anything your parents did. You know, what I mean, it was. It, you could. You could expect the same treatment that you would get at home. Even with these efforts, Southern Black communities felt they were facing terrible limitations in their ability to educate their children. Black schools and white schools were separate and supposed to be equal, but everyone knew they were not. The school that we went to, we called them tar paper shacks. They were really uh, wooden buildings with tar paper on the outside and a wood stove inside. 
The stoves had gotten big holes in them. Uh, when they made fires in them, the hot coals would jump out. Whoever sat behind the stove, that was your job to get the coals back in so the building wouldn't burn. And at the time, you know, when you flip the coals back in, you think it's funny. But we could see that this was no, no condition for learning. And um, we knew that we, we deserved something better. It was very obvious to us that what we had was not equal. And I never really realized how unequal things were until I came back here and had a chance to tour the old white school, which was then closed, and see they had all this stuff stored over there. I mean, they even had, uh, they had like an open area in the center of the school, but they had a garden. I know when I went to college, first biology course I took, they handed us a microscope and slides and um, told us to, you know, to draw amoebas. And I drew dust particles for a couple of weeks because I didn't want anybody to know I didn't know how to use a microscope because we didn't have one. So. In their struggle to give their children equal educational opportunities, black communities seized upon a revolutionary concept, school integration. When I first heard about integration and heard that it may possibly one day be the, you know, the way things would go, I had very mixed feelings about it. I was no more anxious to mingle with white people and I'm sure many of them were anxious to mingle with me. I felt the same reservations, the same um, prejudices, I guess I may, I may as well say, that uh, any of them felt, you know. Um, so I was not at all thrilled over the prospect. But um, as time went on, I began to realize that possibly this was, after all, the only way that the terrible injustices could be somewhat alleviated. We have been on the outside of the mainstream of America's life. We have been on the outside of society. We have been on the outside of education. In their attempt to integrate the schools, frustrated black communities sued Southern school boards. And in May 1954, in the case Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court announced its decision. Separate schools were inherently unequal. School segregation was outlawed, but there was no guarantee the white South would accept that decision. The moment a Negro child walks into the school, every decent, self-respecting, loving parent should take his white child out of that parochial school. When we say walk in, they walk in. When we walk out. Mm -hmm. And it's not right. They have schools just as good as ours. It would be better if they had a choice, but we don't have a choice like they do. See, they can go to ours or they can go to their own, but we have to go to the white school. We have rights, too. Negroes aren't the only ones that have a right. After the Brown decision, things did not change very quickly in terms of school desegregation across the South. As a matter of fact, in many places, after several years, things began to move in the opposite direction. Schools shut down across the South, particularly in Virginia. You began to see a racist backlash in the development of the White Citizens Councils, the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in many parts of the South, and finally, the emergence of a series of very opportunistic white politicians who used the issue of school desegregation as a bloody flag or, uh, which they waved before an outraged white electorate saying segregation now and segregation forever. We shall not submit to Negro dominion another day, another hour, another month. To see just how far white communities went to sabotage school integration, consider the case of Prince Edward County, Virginia, where the local white-dominated government shut down the entire public school system and white residents built private schools for their children. When the schools finally closed, it was like, you know, shock, disbelief. This can't be happening. You know, how, how can it happen? And it was just like somebody, everybody had died. Mm -hmm. 
everybody had died in the community. Mm. Nobody knew what to do. The kids had been locked out of school. It was a nightmare. You don't close schools to, to stop people from getting an education in the 1950s in the United States of America? The, 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 the country that, that, that advocates democracy for everyone all over the world, and you're going to close schools to keep from integrating? I mean, that, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It doesn't gel. That's, you know, that's how I felt, and that's where I still feel. It was white resistance to a Supreme Court ruling, to the law of the land, to what black people saw as the surest path to equality that inspired the Southern black community, and especially young black people, to fight back. And that battle played a major role in making the 60s what they were. The only thing out there in the society that gave one any hope that, that, that gave me any hope that I could do anything with the feelings that were mine and so different from anything else and that couldn't exist in a gray flannel suit was the Negroes, okay? These people way over there, down, they were down south. They weren't in my county. But on the television comes these pictures of these black kids in the compounds down south with the dogs at them, with the hoses on them, you know. Good God, it was just, it was unbelievable. Here were people standing up for something that was vital to them, that was right for them as citizens, moving, f saying no to what they had been and yes to what was promised them and what was inside them. And it, it just, it sliced across the face of the American reality. We grew up in a, in, in a time when none of the adults would take a chance. I'm gonna walk and talk for my freedom Get that good news I'm gonna hold 